Hello and welcome to Welty at Home. We're the slow reading virtual book club that alternates works by Eudora Welty with works by authors connected to Welty. We're currently discussing a selection of works by Welty and others inspired by civil rights leader Medgar Evers. And today we're going to discuss two short but very powerful works, the poem Micah by Margaret Walker and the song Only a Pawn in Their Game by Bob Dylan. I'm Jessica Russell, director of the Eudora Welty House and Garden, and I'm so grateful to be joined by Suzanne Mars, Eudora Welty's friend and biographer, and Professor Emerita at Millsaps College. We're grateful to Susan for guiding these discussions. I always kick off with some housekeeping in case any of you are new. If you want to comment or ask a question, click the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and choose the raise hand function. Uh, Suzanne and I will keep an eye out for those raised hand icons so that we'll know that you're ready to say something. And we hope that you do. Also, be sure to glance over at the chat box. Um, there's usually a lively discussion going on in the chat. And Suzanne and I are gonna kick off the chat discussion today by sharing a link to John Hennigan's May 2013 article about Medgar Evers. A wonderful piece. It's a beautiful piece. And I have one more exciting announcement before we really get into discussing today's works. This is a big one, so listen up. Um, this, this concerns the next two weeks, September 25th and October 2nd. You may have noticed if you're watching the reading schedule that we will discuss Turn Me Loose, The Unghosting of Medgar Evers by Frank X. Walker on those two dates. Suzanne and I are so happy to announce that Frank X. Walker will be joining us virtually on the October 2nd discussion. We're very grateful to him for speaking with our group. The way the reading schedule is going to work, um, you'll get this in your Friday Wealthy at Home email. So this is new information and I wanted to share it with you since I've got most of you right now uh, as soon as it's available. The way we're going to split up Turn Me Loose is on September 25th, our discussion is going to focus on the forward through part two. And on October 2nd, when we have Frank Walker with us, we're going to discuss um, part three and to part five. In addition to any questions that we have for Frank Walker, you are going to have the opportunity to pose questions to, to Mr. Walker, but we ask that you go ahead and submit those questions to us in advance on September 29th um, or, or before. And you can do that by just replying to the Wealthy at Home email that you get on Fridays. If you reply to that, I'll get it. Um, so if you are reading for the September 25th discussion, um, although we're just going to discuss the first half of the book. Don't be shy. Feel free to read ahead and go ahead and prepare questions if you like for Frank Walker. Send them to us. Um, this is how we did it, I believe, for when Natasha Trethaway joined us because we just had so many questions. So we'll, Suzanne and I will make a short list of questions. And if your question is chosen, then you'll get to, to pose that question on October 2nd when, uh, when he is with us. So Suzanne, is there anything else we need to cover before we begin today's discussion on Micah and Only a Pawn in Their Game? No, I think that's all. Uh, if we finish, if by chance we finish uh, with the selected questions, then uh, we'll open it up for anyone to ask questions after that. But this will make sure that we can uh, can manage that uh, discussion pretty efficiently, I hope. Um, let me say a couple of things about last week's session that were questions that were hanging in my mind when we uh, ended, and I'll I'll try to be brief. Anne Day raised the question is who is the where is this voice coming from? And she says that the narrator says everybody. He announces uh, to the uh, to his audience, everybody, listen to this. And let me suggest that everybody might be not just a single reader, not just you as reader, but readers more generally. And that this is a man who is, uh, in a sense, speaking to the readers. And then the second thing I wanted to address, and y'all come back and tell me if you don't agree with this, not today, but sometime, uh, Adrian raised the question that Eudora had said uh, she wasn't worried that people who burn crosses on your lawn don't read The New Yorker. And Adrian pointed out that that was funny and it was true, but that, you know, maybe that means that the story is not reaching the people it should reach. But I want to suggest to you that maybe it is reaching the very people it should reach because um, you're not likely to change the mind of a person who's burning a cross on a lawn, but you are likely to be able to read 
reach uh, readers who may have been complicit in some way with uh, racism, who may not have spoken out, who may uh, not have realized the implications of their position. And you may be reaching readers, you'll be reaching readers nationwide, not just in Mississippi, who are also uh, com may be complicit and whose minds can be changed so that uh, maybe uh, it's uh, it's too bad that uh, she couldn't change the minds of people who might burn crosses on her lawn, but maybe those are the, not the minds that are uh, available to be changed. So we can talk about that. All right, so let's talk about Margaret Walker. Let me say that we have in our uh, discussion today two people who know a lot more about this than I do, about the poem and about Margaret Walker. One is Robert Luckett, who is the director of the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University, the distinguished son of our very own Jean Luckett, uh, who is distinguished in her own right. So uh, we're glad to have Robbie here. And I, Robbie, I'm going to plan on calling on you. I hope you don't mind. And we also have with us Min Rose Gwynn, the author of Remembering Medgar Evers, uh, who was with us uh, last week and uh, who brought some really fascinating new information to me about the song that concludes uh, that story, uh, uh, our story, which was uh, Where is the Voice Coming From? Let me also say that I talked to Margaret Walker about that very song in her own house. I had the good fortune to interview her in uh, 1986 for public radio in Mississippi. And so I went to her home, went upstairs into her study. As I recall, it was upstairs and we sat and talked and she, um, we talked about the story and ha how much she admired it. And she said that she particularly thought the ending with the man pl pulling down his guitar and playing that song was uh, a powerful way to end the story. So I treasure that memory. I'd like to re retrieve that interview from PRM because I can't remember uh, everything that she said to me uh, all these years later, but uh, I'd like to listen to it and, uh, and recall that, so I may do that. All right, uh, many of us have already spent uh, a s number of weeks with Robert Luckett talking about Margaret Walker's novel Jubilee, and we had a biographical sketch of her then, but let me just give a brief one. And Robbie, if I get anything wrong, correct me. Uh, Margaret Walker was born on July 7th, 1915 in Birmingham, Alabama. She died November 30th, 1998 in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, she was staying with a daughter. She was in poor health and was with a daughter in Chicago. Uh, she graduated from Northwestern University with a BA in 1935 and joined the Federal Writers Project in Chicago. She later attended the University of Iowa, Iowa, where she took an MA in 1940 and where she wrote her first book of poems, For My People, which was published in 1942 and won the Yale Younger Poets Award, the first African-American woman to win that award. She began teaching in the 1940s and joined the faculty at Jackson State uh, in 1949. Uh, in 1961, uh, she decided to go back to school. If I got the date right, Robbie, 61, back to the University uh, of Iowa to do a PhD. And uh, she was in Iowa when Medgar Evers was assassinated. She and Medgar Evers lived on the same street in Jackson, Gwine Street. Uh, their children knew each other. She and Merle Evers were members of the Garden Club together. Uh, so the news of this had a very powerful personal as well as public dimension for her. While at Iowa, she finished her first novel, Jubilee, which was published in 1966. It was her doctoral dissertation uh, at Iowa. It was based on the life of her maternal great-grandmother, and talks about the progress of a slave family from the mid to late 19th century forward. In 1998 at Jackson State, Margaret Walker founded the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People. 
Uh, while still on the faculty at Jackson State, she published her second volume of poetry called Prophets for a New Day in 1970. And in that volume, she compares the prophets of the Bible with black leaders of the civil rights movement. In 1973, her third book of poetry, October Journey, which consists mostly of poems commemorating personal heroes. Uh, and she retired from teaching in 1979, but not from writing. She published a biography of Richard Wright, Demonic Genius in 1988, and a volume of poetry called This Is My Century in 1989, which contains a poem about Medgar Evers' uh, burial at Arlington Cemetery, uh, in addition to the one we're going to read today, Micah, which is from Prophets for a New Day. After Margaret Walker retired from teaching, Jackson State had the great wisdom to name its Institute for the Study of History, Life, and Culture, the Margaret Walker Center. So we're very uh, pleased about that, and we're pleased that Robert Luckett is its director. Okay, so we're going to talk about a poem which came from a book called Prophets for a New Day, and I want to read that poem to you, and let's talk a little bit about it, if I can get my Kindle to come up. All right, this is the poem called Prophets for a New Day. As the word came to the prophets of old, as the burning bush spoke to Moses, and the fiery coals cleansed the lips of Isaiah, as the wheeling cloud in the sky clothed the message of Ezekiel, so the word of fire burns today on the lips of our prophets in an evil age, our soothsayers and doom tellers and doers of the word. So the word of the Lord stirs again. These passionate people towards deliverance. Let me read that sentence again. So the word of the Lord stirs again these passionate people toward deliverance. As Amos spoke to the captive children of Judah, preaching to the dispossessed and the poor. So today in the pulpits and the jails, on the highways and in the byways, a fearless shepherd speaks at last to his suffering, weary sheep. So kneeling by the riverbank comes the vision to a valley of believers. So in flaming flags of stars in the sky and in the breaking dawn of a blinding sun, the lamp of truth is lighted in the temple and the oil of devotion is burning at midnight. So the glittering censer in the temple trembles in the presence of the priest and the pillars of the doorpost move and the incense rises in smoke and the dark faces of the sufferers gleam in the new morning. The complaining faces glow and the winds of freedom begin to blow while the word descends on the waiting world below. A beast is among us. His mark is on the land. His horns and his hands and his lips are gory with our blood. He is war and famine and pestilence. He is death and destruction and trouble. And he walks in our houses at noonday and devours our defenders at midnight. He is the demon who drives us with whips of fear, and in his cowardice, he cries out against liberty. He cries out against the humanity, against all dignity of green valleys and high hills, against clean winds blowing through our living, against the broken bodies of our brothers. He has crushed them with a stone. He drinks our tears for water, and he drinks our blood for wine. He eats our flesh like a ravenous lion, and he drives us out of the city to be stabbed on a lonely hill. So what about this poem, Prophets for a New Day, the title poem for a volume that includes Micah? Any first reactions to that poem? Anyone want to speak about that poem? I have a specific question I want to ask, and I want to ask first about the title. Why is it prophets for a new day instead of of a new day? 
Why prophets for a new day, do you think? Poet is going to choose her words very carefully. These are powerful words. Yeah, Beverly. Uh, because if it were of a new day, that would mean that we already had the new day. And these are the prophets that, and as she's writing this, she's indicating that we have not reached our new day yet. Yeah. And she indicates it very powerfully, doesn't she? The third uh -huh. section of the poem is, a beast is among us. A beast, uh -uh. gory with our blood, drinking our tears for water and our blood for wine. I mean, this beast is still here. Yeah, so it's not, the new day is not with us yet. You think there's any other reason why it would be for a new day instead of of a new day? I'm, I'm thinking and uh, that these are prophets who are advocating uh, these are prophets who want that new day, who are advocates for a new day, uh, as well as, uh, so they're prophets, but they're also advocates, uh, calling for that new day. Anything else about that? Okay. So is there, I, I'll, let me ask Robbie about this. It seems to me she's also sounding a kind of ecological note here. Do you think she is in this poem, or am I getting ahead of myself in a poem that written, published yeah, in the second? Yeah, I think so, uh, possibly. I would just note that, you know, from the perspective of a historian, um, Margaret has been, by 1970, when this book is published, living with the trauma of, uh, of, of loss and, and great leadership for a number of years, of course, she was incredibly close to Medgar and his family. They not only lived on the same street, they worked on the same street. Their offices were next to each other. Their kids grew up together. They were in garden club together. But she's also going to be deeply impacted by Martin Luther King's assassination. She's going to start an MLK Day program in, at Jackson State in January of 1969. And remember, in 1970, when this book is published, that May, we're going to have the shootings on our campus where police fire 500 rounds of ammunition in uh, 28 seconds into a woman's dorm and shoot 14 students, murdering two of them. Um, and she, Margaret, was a, a we, we know a lot of her feelings because she was an avid diarist, a journalist. Uh, she kept a personal journal for 60 years. It's 13,000 handwritten pages, and she writes about the impact these losses have on her. And so she is she is feeling um, a righteous anger <laughs> when this book is published in 1970. Um, she remains hopeful, though, for the for a, a, a new day. Um, but she's also really upset. She is just she's got a lot weighing on her in 1970 um, by the time this is coming down and the loss of Medgar was, a, was a, an, an early one that just deeply impacted her um, and her life. Um, as for the, the ecological um, issue, she's certainly concerned about those. Um, but I think more than anything, she's really, um, it, she just is, 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 is concerned about what's facing her community, her people, for her people. Right. right. Um, and I would just note on this call, too, we have Miss Angela Stewart, who's our longtime archivist at the moment. But Margaret. I hadn't seen her. There. Um, and also a great um, Margaret Walker scholar uh, in her own right. Um, I just would recognize Miss Stewart. Yeah, we need to have Miss Stewart speak here. I didn't, I can't see everyone, but I, I'm glad you're here. Uh, let me say one, ask both you and Miss Stewart one more question, and that is finishing this poem prophets for a new day with the beast in the street, not beginning with the beast in the street and, and then following with the prophets for a new day, but finishing, is, does that suggest a kind of darkness of vision, a uh, 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 hope that uh, is perhaps uh, not secure? For sure. Uh, she, especially in the context of, of where we're standing in 1970, shortly after Dr. King's assassination. And, um, you know, the, the, she is kind of consumed by this doubt and this, to a certain extent, I think a, a, a deep rage about the loss around her. 
Um, and yet she um, also has a very keen Christian sensibility and she does believe in rebirth and she does, you know, believe in um, a resurrection and, and a new day to come. Um, and, you know, her faith and spirituality is, a, is a, a really important part of who she is as a, as a, as a person. And so she's balancing the two. You can, uh, and, and really when we talk about Micah, you can feel like how angry she is and yet, at the same time, I think there is some hope there. So there's definitely, she's trying to balance that darkness with the hope for for, for resurrection and renewal. Well, let's move to Mike. I will say that in Prophets for a New Day, there are a number of prophets mentioned and who are linked to civil rights leaders. So Benjamin May, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah linked to Benjamin May, Isaiah to Roy Wilkins, Amos, and there are two Amos poems, to Martin Luther King, Hosea to James Farmer, Joel to John Lewis, and Micah uh, to Medgar Evers. So let's talk a little bit about the, the book of Micah. Um, Minrose, would you mind if I called on you to say anything? Or I can read your book, uh, a little bit paragraph from your book about Micah. Whoops, we're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you want me to talk about uh, yeah, Micah just, a little bit? Just a little bit about the the Bibles, the book of Micah and the Bible. And uh, yeah. Um, well, Micah was an eighth century prophet, and um, the Israel um, in which Micah lived was very similar, actually, to the Jim Crow Mississippi. Uh, there was chaos. There were there were murders. There was violence. There was um, injustice. Uh, huge injustices in which um, very powerful people could come in and um, and and take the land or kill or uh, do all sorts of things to people who had less power. And so that's the context. I think that. That and I think that's the reason that she chose Micah, you know, as the prophet to represent uh, Medgar Evers, and 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 uh, of course the um, subtitle of Micah is in memory of Medgar Evers of Mississippi. Uh, so uh, they were very similar in many ways, and I think she chose her prophets very carefully for each of her civil rights um, leaders, you know, that, that she rep represented. And I also think the other thing that I found about this poem that, that it, um, uh, just as was said, was that um, in, in Walker's poems, there's so much anger and grief, grief um, over uh, the traumas of the period and her own personal sense of trauma, but also a larger cultural trauma. But in the end, she does lift her poems oftentimes, lift them in certain ways, whether it's through religion, uh, a religious vision or whatever. And, and this poem at the very end, when we get to talking about it, uh, she ends with, um, uh, Micah was a man just echoing the um, uh, wish for African-American men of the period to be considered men. Uh, so many of them held up signs during protest movements. I am a man. And in fact, Medgar Evers himself did this. So um, those, those are my thoughts, I guess, about the poem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so here she's chosen a book very purposely, and here's a woman who knows her Bible. I, I now have read the book of Micah. I have to say, <laughs> this was my first reading of the book of Micah. So <laughs> Margaret Walker knows this book, and she knows that in this book, Micah, the prophet, is attacking social injustice. He's attacking the corruption of people in high places. And he is uh, proclaiming that God is going to judge Judah and Jerusalem, and uh, they are going to be uh, defeated. 
uh, that people are going to have to go into exile because they have failed to establish justice, but that God then will restore them to the land. Uh, so there's both judgment and uh, and hope. Uh, is that fair enough, uh, Minrose? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I want to quote just a few passages, a very famous passages that are in Micah, and then we'll talk about the poem. This is from chapter four, verses three and four. He, that is God, shall judge between many peoples and set terms for strong and distant nations. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. They shall all sit under their own vines, under their own fig trees, undisturbed, for the Lord of hosts has spoken. And I wanted to read that, especially for some of the imagery that we're going to find in the poem. And then uh, chapter 6, verse 8. You have been told, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. Do justice, love goodness, and walk humbly with your God. Okay, let's talk about Micah. Uh, and I think we'll we'll talk about it. Uh, I'll read it, and then let's talk about it line by line. And how about that? As we do in our English classes, right, Beverly? All right. Micah was a young man of the people who came up from the streets of Mississippi and cried out his vision to his people, who stood fearless before the waiting throng like an astronaut shooting into space. Micah was a man who spoke against oppression, crying, woe to you, workers on iniquity. Woe to you, doers of violence. Woe to you, breakers of the peace, crying, woe to you, my enemy. For when I fall, I shall rise in deathless dedication. When I stagger under the wounds of your paid assassins, I shall be whole again in deathless triumph. For your rich men are full of violence and your mayors of your cities speak lies. They are full of deceit. We do not fear them. They shall not enter the city of goodwill. We shall dwell under our vine and fig tree in peace and they shall not be remembered in the book of life. Micah was a man. Okay, anyone want to talk about general issues first, and then we'll go line by line. Any general comments? Big picture comments. I can't get any takers. Well, let's start off then. Micah was a young man of the people. So here is the first line. If your reader is paying attention at all, he's going to be paying attention at the first line, right? Why begin like this? Micah was a young man of the people. Why those words? Any suggestions? Laura, what if I pick on you? Beverly has her hand up. Okay, Beverly. Um, well, I think for one thing, he's establishing, she's establishing um, Edgar Evers as being a young man, you know, a young man who would have a family who has, who's at the beginning of what could be a long and fabulous life, uh, raising his children, living with his wife, but he is a man of the people, which means that he has dedicated himself to working for or to to helping his his people who in this case happen to be african americans who are not being allowed to vote and who are being suppressed by jim crow laws so i think she establishes you know who he is he's he's a youth you know for one thing he's a young man but he's also one of them he's not you know, an outside agitator, shall we say. Yeah, He's a, a young man Thompson. of the people. As Alan Thompson would have him. Uh, yeah, so he's young. Mm -hmm. He's a man. 
That is, and that line is going to be echoed again at the end, but his youth taken from us at age 37 and of the people of uh, uh, the common man. And I think primarily African-American, but also he's saying racism victimizes white people as well as black people. We are all diminished by it. And so of, of the people, I would say uh, more generally, but particularly of of his people as Margaret Walker was writing for her people. Yeah, Minrose. Well, um, of the people is is kind of the phrase that jumps out at me too, is is that he was he would he grew up, Micah like Evers grew up in a poor farming family. So he came from very um obscure roots, you know, to uh rise to uh, the level of, of being a prophet like Evers himself. So I think that's an interesting aspect of this as well. Yeah, so here he is out in Meridian in the countryside, uh, not of the capital city, not of a prominent family, and he rises to be the leader of his people who came up from the streets of Mississippi. So we've got Micah coming up from the streets of Mississippi. So the biblical character and the contemporary figure emerging here and cried out his vision to his people. What about that? And cried out his vision to his people. Why vision there? What was the vision? Or am I being too obvious here? Nobody wants to talk about that. What do you think? Write out his vision to his people. I'm going to go on just two more lines. Who stood? Pearl has her hand up, Suzanne. Oh, yeah. Okay, Pearl, go. Uh, so, well, first of all, it's capitalized, calling our attention yes. to it, as the poet would do. And it does uh, parallel the passages that you read from Micah, but the the vision was, I think, for equality for the people, the, the promise that had been given to them. And um, I would also point us to Charla's comment in the chat about um, the prophets in the Bible always beginning by establishing uh, the authority and the, the time, the place, the person, the biography. And, that, and that's true in a lot of different genres that you start out with that authority. Um, but the vision, I think, is for the equality. And it, it shows us that both Micah and Medgar Evers were speaking to those people. They weren't, key, it wasn't a private um, vision. It was a public vision that he was speaking. Yeah, Micah talks about uh, people being uh, routed from their homes, about uh, authorities uh, misusing their power against uh, the people. And here is Medgar Evers saying things like, you know, uh, in his ad address on May the 20th on national TV, um, Mayor Thompson says the police are here 24 hours a day, seven days a week protecting us. And he says, perhaps harassing us, you know, uh, here is the vision. Let's see what the reality is and let's see what it should be. So, yeah. And I, yeah, Pearl points out the capitalization, the poet calling attention to the word, the echoing of the biblical kind of pattern language, I think. Who stood fearless before the waiting throng like an astronaut shooting into space. Why that image, like an astronaut shooting into space? In 1970, this poem comes to in fact, Medgar Evers himself used that image in his speeches. Um, see if I can find one where I have written down the page number. Minrose has her hand up. Yeah, go, Minrose. Can we, we're not hearing you, Minrose. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was having trouble with my computer. 
I think one one really this is kind of a small point, I guess, but one thing that really strikes me about the poem is is the kind of well, of course, you have the astronaut um, um, image here um, and shooting off into space, but really Evers was a man who a leader who off usually worked under under the um, radar. He he went and talked to people and then he did things this way and that way. And of course he led marches and that sort of thing, but he was always working under the radar to get voters registered and do this and do that task to um, investigate all of these murders that were happening in Mississippi, including of course, as you pointed out, Suzanne, the still murder. But when he took to the television, and he didn't really want to do that television uh, piece, but he decided that was what was necessary. It was like he was kind of an astronaut shooting into space. It it was kind of like he was all of a sudden he 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 had this voice that you know carried so much further over the airway. So um, I think perhaps maybe. She's thinking of that, um, that kind of aspect of him uh, as someone who perhaps had been working for many years under, he'd been working many, many years, uh, as you pointed out in your biography piece uh, last time, and then, but he often worked under under the radar and didn't make all these public speeches and, and stuff like that like King did. I think also there's that there's that notion. I remember when the first space flight took place in 1969. I was so amazed. I was in England, and after that we saw it, we went out and looked up. You know, oh my God! And there was this just amazement that this could happen, a new day. And you know, I think she's seizing upon that. If this can happen, if men can go into space. Can we change what's here on earth? Can we make that change uh, as well? And then how much courage it takes to get on top of a rocket engine. I don't know if anybody besides me, this is uh, uh, is watching the morning show, but the morning show, they were just getting up and to go off into space. <laughs> uh, the, the nerve it takes to do that. Uh, and so the bravery being echoed, I think. And then the fact that Evers in his speeches says things like this, this is in a speech he gave, and this is a speech he gave variations of it different times. Uh, spaceships read about in Buck Rogers comic strips 20 years ago are realities today. Even with this amazing advance in science and technology, man has not done this, has not done this day what God would have us do. That is, love our neighbor as ourselves, especially if one's neighbor happens to be black and the other neighbor white. Love your neighbor as yourself. So there is that. And you wonder if Margaret Walker wasn't drawing upon having heard those speeches, having read those speeches. Okay, let's go on. Micah was a man who spoke against oppression, crying, woe to you, workers on iniquity crying, woe to you, doers of violence, crying, woe to you, breakers of the peace, crying, woe to you, my enemy. What about those lines and what's the source of the power of those lines, uh, do you think? Anyone want to comment on those? That pattern of parallelism and repetition Woe to you being repeated over and over again. We go back in American literature to Walt Whitman and the, this kind of technique being used so effectively. And here is Margaret Walker using it, I think. Iniquity, violence, breakers of the peace. Those are my enemies. Iniquity, violence, breakers of the peace. <clears throat> And I think that repetition, that pattern of parallelism and repetition is very powerful. Okay. For when I fall, I shall rise in deathless dedication. 
when I stagger under the wound of your paid assassins, I shall be whole again in deathless triumph. For your rich men are full of violence, and your mayors of your cities speak lies. They are full of deceit. Okay, what about that? What does this suggest to us? What is Margaret Walker pointing out to us here, do you think? Suggestions? And certainly Mayor Alan Thompson had been speaking lies, I think, uh, and had been deceitful in his negotiations uh, when the boycott of Capitol Street stores was ongoing. Beverly. Uh, it's an indictment of the white powers that be. You know, it's not, this is, of course, she's writing this after the the bombing at the church in Birmingham, but Medgar Evers' assassination was just a few months before that happened. So that, you know, that's that violence, that violent uh, atmosphere created by um, mayors and policemen and uh, Klansmen and, you know, political powers. Um, I think that she is, she's calling them out. Well, there's just been a sit in at Woolworths on Capitol Street, people right. being, uh, and, uh, and why, what were they doing there? They were boycotting. They wanted to be able to be seated at lunch counters. There was a boycott uh -huh. against the economic powers that be the stores on Capitol Street. So calling out your rich men. Here are the men who profit from black people doing business with them, but who won't let them use the lunch counter, who won't extend titles of courtesy to them, who won't hire them, who won't have first come, first serve. So all of that. Yeah, Pearl. Um, I, I totally agree. She's she's indicting the the context. And as Robbie reminded us, this is just very shortly after Martin Luther King had also been killed in in the city uh, by the the you know by the violence of the day. Um, my, I have a kind of a question that maybe Robbie or Minrose can answer. Were these poems that she collected in Prophets for the New Day, and specifically Michael, were they published? independently were they public you know like they were gathered together in 1970 but was it printed earlier than that thank you for asking me. i tried to find out and couldn't find out robbie or angela let's Let angela jump in there she's got her hand up yeah angela let's hear from you yes those points were published by an independent publisher dudley randall who owned broadside press um it was Actually, Margaret Walker's getting back into publishing. She hadn't published, especially poetry, in a while. Mm -hmm. And she had the opportunity to go to Detroit and meet with Dudley Randall. And then, but she always wrote way ahead of when she published. So the, the poems were written before they were published, but they were published by Broadside Press, which is an African, was an African-American independent publisher out of Detroit, Michigan. So they were all published in 1970, but she had been writing them. Oh, yeah. She she wrote all the time. Um, it's She never had a consistent publisher. Mm -hmm. She never had a literary agent. So she didn't write in terms of, she wrote all the time. She just didn't publish all the um, time. So probably the poem about uh, Micah was probably written in 1963 but not published until 1970. Is that likely or was it written? Later? Yes, that's likely. That's like, that's very likely. Good. Thank you. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, I would note to you too, Suzanne, that in 1970, even though this may have been published before, Margaret, especially in her journals, uh, takes to task Russell Davis, who's then mayor of Jackson. Oh. And if you think about the shootings that happened in 1970 at Jackson State, the oh. Thompson tank that Alan Thompson had purchased ahead of Freedom Summer in 1964 accompanied the police on campus in 1970. So even with with Micah written before 1970, within the context, she's still, this is, these are all emotions that keep being brought up and she's feeling them really deeply. It's kind of, she is a prophet, Robbie. She's <laughs> foreseeing this. Her, this is her prophecy. 
<laughs> for the new day. Let's finish the poem. We'll try to talk about some about Bob Dylan. Um, these, ma these men are full of deceit. We do not fear them. They shall not enter the city of goodwill. We shall dwell under our vine and fig tree in peace. And they shall not be remembered in the book of life. Micah was a man. Is this a suggestion? I, I, I love that vine and fig tree because could be vine and fig tree in Jackson, Mississippi very easily, but it's also the image directly from the book uh, of Micah. So she was picking yes. up the biblical language, using that in a very authentic kind of way. And earlier, uh, Micah has said, I shall be whole again in deathless triumph. And is that deathless triumph the triumph of this poem, the triumph of memory, uh, as well as the triumph of the resurrection uh, in terms of Christian faith? Is that part of what we're dealing with here? That Alan Thompson is a footnote, Medgar Evers is not. Medgar um, Evers is a man, Medgar Evers is remembered. Russell Davis, is it, da is it Davis? Yeah, yes. Davis, I, I've totally forgotten about him. Now I'm remembering his being mayor. Another footnote, Medgar Evers is not the footnote, yeah. So. John, you're keeping quiet, I'm disappointed in you. You know, um, go ahead, Angela. Also, when she uses this imagery, you also have to remember she was born in 1915. And yeah. people didn't just read the Bible on Sunday for church. <laughs> it was something they learned in school. It was something that was referenced in politics. Because we know from, if you've seen Hamilton, you know that George Washington actually used that exact same passage mm -hmm. from um, Micah in one of his addresses. So. So it was common for her to use Bible, matter of fact, she taught Bible as literature at Jackson State. So it was common for her to use the Bible that way. And she's saying, of course, Maker Evers is going to be timeless, but there's something tragic in that timelessness, you know, because people shouldn't have to die to right. be timeless, to be, and they should, and, the thing that she also used in picking Micah, particularly for um, Medgar Evers, is that Micah was somebody who had to call out his own circle of people, the cult of the temple. Mm -hmm. Medgar Evers in his lifetime was an NAACP employee, but he was more a man of the people so that oftentimes he would do things in direct contrast to what they wanted the Mississippi and AACP to be doing. So she's, you know, she's tying all that up into Micah into this really, point. Yeah. I think that's really important. That man who is a man of the people, not of his organization. He supports his organization, but if you need to do more, if you need to do something differently, he will. The tragedy, but the mem remembrance is the triumph in tragedy or from tragedy, yeah. And then back to the line, Micah was a man, which Monroe spoke so eloquently about. I think we had Pearl and Monroe's as well. Any final comments on Micah? Somebody else's dog is speaking. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say a couple of things, one, that this repetition uh, that you alluded to referencing Whitman, um, but also the repetition of a young man was a man and then ending with was a man, uh, mm -hmm. Natasha Trethaway talks about uh, the refrain and the repetition as holding one accountable, keeping you within that circle so that you cannot necessarily just dismiss it. Uh, that, that That's what she does when she is doing such repetition. And I'm also struck by how Walker's poem um, is indicting and addressing the culture uh, of 
of the oppression and the violence and the injustices, whereas Welty's story is zeroing in on the particular person within that culture assassinating Medu Ever. So it's a kind of a, a different, a forward-looking one and an inward-looking one. I, but I think Welty is also addressing the cultural situation. I mean, there's the newspaper. Uh, right. I'm not saying she's not. I'm just saying this one is yeah. very pointedly yeah. not not indicting the assassin himself. Is making yeah. Med as a larger figure. Yeah, you're off. And a focus on the man who has been murdered that, at, at the center. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, a wonderful poem. I think it's uh, it's and I want to say as a poem, as well as a document, it speaks to us historically, it speaks to the social situation, but it's, but it's construction, it's imagery, uh, the, the repetition you uh, alluded to, Pearl, uh, tying the poem together. So I think it is a really, uh, a very powerful poem, as well as a powerful statement, making a powerful statement. Okay. Let me say a bit about Bob Dylan, uh, someone I am old enough to remember uh, in his youth. Um, born 1941, uh, when he's uh, just in his 20s, he writes this uh, song only a pawn in the game. He comes to Greenwood, Mississippi with Theodore Bacall. I think Pete Seeger is also here. Uh, they perform these songs in a cotton field in Greenwood for a small 300, 400 people. Uh, and then he performs the same song at the March on Washington uh, sometime. July 6th, he's here in Mississippi. May 26th, May 29th, he's at the March on Washington and uh, performing for this massive audience. Uh, his poem, Only a Pawn in the Game. Of course, Bob Dylan is a man who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in uh, 2016 and received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012. He has many Grammys. He was associated with uh, the protest movement of the 60s with songs like Blowing in the Wind and The Times They Are a Changing. Uh, he's also published six books of drawings and paintings. He's exhibited in art galleries. So he's a kind of, of Renaissance man. But the poem, the song or poem we're interested in today, and I'm not gonna sing it for you, nor am I gonna play it, I'm gonna read it, is, I'd love to sing it, but you don't wanna hear that, uh, is only a pawn in the game. So let's talk about this poem. A bullet from the back of a bush took Medgar Evers' blood. A finger fired the trigger to his name. A handle hit out in the dark. A hand set the spark. Two eyes took, a, took the aim behind a man's brain. But he can't be blamed. He's only a pawn in their game. A South politician preaches poor, to the poor white man. You got more than the blacks. Don't complain. You're better than them. You've been born with white skin, they explain. And the Negro's name is used, it is plain, for the politician's game, gain as he rises to fame. And the poor man and the poor white remains on the caboose of the train. But it ain't him to blame. He's only a pawn in the game. The deputy sheriffs, the soldiers, the governors get paid, and the marshals and cops get the same. But the poor white man's used in the hands of them all like a tool. He's taught in his school from the start by the rule that the laws are with him to protect his white skin, to keep up his hate so he never thinks straight about the shape that he's in. But it ain't him to blame. He's only a pawn in their game. From the poverty shacks, he looks from the cracks to the tracks and the hoofbeats pound in his brain and he's taught how to walk in a pack, shoot in the back with his fist in a clinch, to hang and to lynch, to hide neath the hood, to kill with no pain like a dog on a chain. He ain't got no name, but it ain't him to blame. He's only a pawn in their game. Today, Medgar Evers was buried from the bullet he caught. They lowered him down as a king. 
But when the shadowy sun set on the one that fired the gun, he'll see by his grave on the stone that remains carved next to his name, his epitaph plain, only a pawn in their game. All right. What about this song? R written immediately after the assassination of Medgar Evers by a very young man, a young man of the people, we might say. Yeah. Teresa. I see this really as um, a call to action uh, from Bob Dylan to people to stand up for what is right and not to be manipulated by those in power. So if you, you know, in essence, if the common man sees something wrong, he should do something about it and just not turn away. Okay, so it's a poem about manipulation and he sees the poor whites as manipulated. Is it, I think, um, as Memrose has pointed out in her book, uh, Byron Dilla Beckwith doesn't exactly fit, fit this portrait of poor whites. Beckwith came from uh, a plantation owning family. Uh, he had sort of, he was not a pillar of the community in Greenwood. He was, um, had finally sold his right in the plantation land to buy a, a house in a middle-class neighborhood, which he later sold and moved into the derelict family home in Greenwood, which was really a, a ruin, pretty much of a ruin. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He was an abusive husband, but he was uh, a middle-class man. He was not uh, poverty-stricken in the sense that these, this person seems to be. Uh, he did, I think he was manipulated by his own desire for acceptance. Uh, he wanted the white citizen, he wanted to be, um, he was a member of the White Citizens Council. He wanted the respect, uh, the admiration of those men who were in the White Citizens Council who would be the ones who might be turning him into a pawn. But he's very different from, uh, from the man in the poem. Does that make a difference in the success of the song, do you think? That he, you know, as Welty um, said, I, Charlotte Capers said to Eudora Welty, you thought it was a Snopes, but it was a Compson. All right. So as I, we were talking last time, I'd say if it's a Compson, it's Jason Compson. But Bob Dylan has gotten it wrong as well in that, in that sense. What does that do to our understanding of the song, do you think? Pearl. Well, first, I wonder, did uh, was Byron Dilla Beckwith already arrested when Dylan came to Greenwood and and wrote or performed this song? So he knew. Yeah, who he I think was. he was. Yeah, I think he was because uh, the story came out on July sixth, and uh, Eudora had had to change her story mm -hmm. because of that. Minrose, is that right? Yeah, he was already arrested. Yes. Yeah, yes. All right. So, but also, um, when I first listened to this song, when I was teaching the story, it is Dylan's song that made me try to understand the assassin presented in Welty's story, to begin to think about the possibly having some empathy for him, not for killing Edvers, exactly, of course, but the same way when I read Moby Dick, I try to think about Ahab, you know, you know, what was his humanity? What was his motivation? So this song helped me to think about uh, the murderer, the assassin as um, a, the pawn in the game. What was his condition that made him react this way? All right, Charlotte. Oops, we're not hearing you, Charlotte. You need to unmute. Maybe, can I unmute you? Now? Now we can hear you. Okay. Um, it, I just wanted to, to make a comment as far as my understanding of, of Bob Dylan's lyrics in general and many of his lyrics. He was in his 20s. Uh, he was going with Joan Baez and Joan Baez was very a, a real activist, but Bob Dylan was not a real activist. He wrote 
you know, he said, all I wanted to do was write my songs and have somebody listen to them. So he was not a big activist in that sense. He, you know, he wrote his songs about what he saw. And in other songs, he's, I think he said that it's not race, it's class. And so when he talks about, you know, the situation with Medgar Evers, um, he sees that as the bottom line is the power structure, which uh, oppresses not only black people, but white, uh, white people, rural white people, especially, uh, to keep their power going. Let, uh, let me just ask, uh, Jessica, can I ask one more question? I wanted to ask Robbie as a civil rights historian. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I'm just here to say we're up on time, but if we have any closing comments, we have time for two or three closing comments. My interest is, I think uh, he's right in a sense, isn't he, that poor white people, in fact, were manipulated. In this case, the murderer was not necessary, was not, did not fit the profile he provides, but the profile he provides was one of uh, that uh, was manipulated. Uh, other people did manipulate people of that profile. See, am I right? And, and and frequently manipulated by the rich men and the the mayors of cities that Margaret calls out and prophets of a new day. If, I mean, you think about Beckwith being a member of the Citizens Council and the Klan. You know, he's involved in both. Yeah. So that, uh, but Dylan doesn't describe Beckwith, but what he describes is uh, pretty powerfully. Uh, accurate is that was that fair to say i think so to me for sure okay and minrose you, you want to you talk about this too what do you think well one thing i think to think about too is that um there's a stereotype of the poor rural um person uh to men uh particularly as being more racist and uh, more violent during this period than were the white, um, I mean, th than were the uh, more upper class, middle to upper class uh, people. And I think that's something just to weigh into the discussion uh, that it's easy, I think, to get drawn into the idea that the poor, poor person here is the one responsible for the violence when perhaps it is um, not, you know, that not necessarily that case. And I think in the in the case of Beckwith, that's certainly true. I know that one one interesting little interesting tidbit of this is one of the um, women who wrote songs about Beckwith. Pa did so when she discovered in the 1980s he he was living on um, on the um, this is before he was actually you know convicted third, for the third trial but he he was uh, living on Lookout Mountain in Tennessee uh, organizing a neighborhood cleanup uh, uh, community cleanup. And she discovered that the person she was working with to help clean up uh, their community there on Lookout Mountain was indeed none other than Byron Dell Beckwith. So I think that's a that's a very interesting aspect to this too, the stereotyping um, aspect. aspect. Think, and maybe what Dylan wants to point out is that uh, a lot of uh, middle class, upper class white people who think their hands are clean of violence, they're not. Exactly. They have used others to perpetrate it. Okay, Angela, well, this will be our last comment with our three experts. Yeah, and I think what we have to remember, and it even goes back to Mari Walker and her fight against Theodore Bilbo, is that when you read things like Revolt of the Rednecks and Landings on the Levee by Leroy Percy, racism and class can be, they can be interchangeable. It's not just, Poor whites who were racist and violent 
it's not just Southern whites. It's something that affects all white people. So to just say, feel like you can just stereotype. I mean, we've seen that with Black Lives Matter. You know, you've had George Floyd was living in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> not the deep south, you know, and that been killed by a policeman. So so that you we shouldn't put labels and think that, okay, this is just something that happens among a certain group of people. And I think that's what's important about that, to know that this could be anybody. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. And that uh but I I think Dylan is yeah, drawing on the stereotype, but I also think He's, it's important that he mark, points out that there are manipulative people who may not be violent in themselves, but who are using the violence of others. But that's yes, not to say definitely. It's not. That's not to say there are not violent people like Beckwith who uh, who do live on Lookout Mountain or other mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, other uh, locales. All, all right. Any last comments, Jessica? We'll turn it over to you now. All right. Well, we'll see you next week, September 25th and October 2nd. We'll be talking about Turn Me Loose, the unghosting of Edmagor Evers. And if you have questions for Mr. Walker, be sure to email Welty at home your uh, email. Reply them uh, to that email to me and I'll see him. Thanks to Angela and Robbie and Minrose. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>